So that is the aim for today. Um, but how did we end up here with a pile of stuff on a table and all this? So I make music for fun. I don't do it very well. And rather than making my music better, I did what every good musician does. I went and did something else. And so I started exploring making cool videos to go with the crappy music. And so um, then I was playing with a few ideas. Hack Week was coming up. I had been watching too much YouTube. I had been making questionable eBay purchases. And I had this box sitting on my desk at home. And Hack Week rolled around and I thought, you know what, instead of playing with software to make video effects, I'm going to pull apart some hardware. And so this project was started. Um, so the first disclaimer in all of this, I'm a software engineer. I'm in no way an electrical engineer. I don't really know what I'm doing. The best part about that is you too can not know what you're doing and end up with something cool later. If I can do it, you can do it. Um, disclaimer number two is much more important though. Don't modify stuff that takes 240 volts or 230 volts or 110 volts for it, or 20 for our American friends, unless you actually do know what you're doing. Um, we'll come back to that, but safety warning, there will be fast flickering images at some point, hopefully, if everything is half working. I can't really control that. Um, I'll try and give you some warnings, but if that is a health issue for you, I will take no offense if you head out now. Um, so to start with, we're gonna look at how does one create video glitch art? Um, and so the first way you can do that is analog video symbol signals, especially composite. Who remembers these yellowy VCR connectors? These have the video signal in terms of all the picture data, along with the sync signal, all in the same cable. And so if you mash two of those together that are out of sync, you will get glitchy weirdness, and that's a bit of fun. The other way is once you started to get to devices this age and slightly newer. There was some DSP going on. Generally, each video frame was being loaded into a memory chip. And if you start shorting the pins on those memory chips, you can corrupt the memory and you can make some cool effects sometimes. So that is, a, that is another good way of doing it. Unfortunately, to figure out what you're gonna do there, you kind of have to have the device running and start shorting pins together while it's running to see what happens. So that's not for everyone, but it's an option. Um, feedback, I will show you that later because, oh, hang on, we can do that with the other. If we take the camera that works here, um, and if I try and point it at the projector screen, you're gonna see, oh, for the video guys, can you mute the HDMI audio? Uh, yeah, the HDMI is muted. Okay. So we're getting audio feedback as well, but you can see, if you point a camera at the screen it's displaying, you can make cool, glitchy things. And I wasn't expecting that to work that well in here. Um, so then the final way is you can use a video synthesizer. So in the same way that an audio synthesizer generates um, audio, um, a video synthesizer, you feed a sine wave into a video signal, you might get a nice red picture. Um, so that's the final way we can create video glitchy art. Today we're going to do a couple of those. Um, firstly, we're going to look at a very simple electrical circuit called Carl Klomp's Dirty Video Mixer. Basically, all we are doing here is taking two video signals and ramming them together using one of these slidey pot things where you put one source there, the other source there, and you spin the knob to blend between them. And so I have one of these. It did come desoldered during travel, but if I get the wire in the right spot, it might stay together for long enough to show you what this does if it works. I'm gonna plug the video signal in there. We're gonna take that video signal. If I was smart, I would have requested a talk slot straight after lunch so that I could set all this up. Um, that one there. 
Now, if I come back to our live feed, oh, we can see we've got an installation guide. That is great. I have two media players here. They are identical, which means they share the same remote, which means I'm going to change things on both. Um, but we, it turns out that I'm not going to stand in front of the speaker because that would be bad. Turns out that the easiest way to make something from the media device does not exist. That's that is a new one that didn't happen last time. Um, but it turns out the easiest way to do this is um, by getting a set-top box. All right, we're going to go... Yep, I'm unplugging cables. If I unplug them into each other, we'll get the other media player. And hopefully the other media player has a USB stick in it with some video that exists. There we go. We have a lovely Hackweek image. And so now, also plugged into my video mixer, which if I get this guy here, you can kind of see there. Um, I have, I'm gonna run out of hands. Here we go. Here is my reversing camera that I bought off eBay for not much. I'm gonna point that down here somewhere as well. Maybe, who knows? Need more hands? I do need more hands, but now if I start to come through here, you can see we're blending out one signal and then we're gonna blend in the opposite signal. And so this is our first way of, and you can kind of find somewhere here that looks kind of coolish. And then you go, well, I'm just going to switch to that video source and make it good. I'm going to switch the other way back to that one. And But you'll start to notice that as I come towards the middle and nothing can really figure out which of the two sync sources we should be using, we are starting to get into our first bit of problems. Although it's, oddly enough, at this conference, it's doing better than it did last conference. The best, the best thing about all this gear is you never know what is going to happen. <laughs> and that is half the point, and today that looks kind of cool. Um, but So that is this circuit, and so we're going with, well, this was cheap and easy. I bought these components from a parts store for $10. The reason it's in an old T-tin is because the T-tin was $1, and a proper electrical case is $10. And I didn't want to spend more on a box than, than the electrical components. Um, so that, there you go, there's a picture of my, I made this on the Saturday afternoon before I came. So there is the picture of the pretty simple insides. So this is simple and easy, but it's simple, easy, cheap, right? Not kind of really. There are some problems. Today we didn't see the problems yet, which is nice, but the issue is, if you take a normal analog to digital video converter, the minute you feed it something dumb that it doesn't understand, it's going to go, I don't know, I give up, no signal, um, which is not what you want to see. Um, and even depending on the analog device you're using, you might get completely different effects. Apparently today, depending on the day, we might get completely different effects as well. Um, so there's a couple of solutions. One of them costs money. The other one might not cost much money if you get lucky on Marketplace. So the easy solution is you go on Facebook Marketplace and you spend $50 on a CRT TV. And CRT TVs are great. You can feed them whatever crappy signal you want and they will do their best to display it. And it will look cool and interesting. So that's one way. The other way is a slightly more proper way, which is something called a time-based corrector, which is basically, in instead of using the sync signals from the video sources coming in, it's creating its own sync signal and then mapping the video to that, which then means you can feed it into a digital converter and it will understand what's going on. That is what I'm doing today. 
that is why we didn't just see no signal before. Um, there's the slide I was talking about. Um, there is an open hardware version around. The schematics are there. I haven't seen much activity on it. You will probably have to create your own PCB if you want to go down that way. Um, there are commercial, commercial solutions as well. Some of them are very expensive. Sometimes you get lucky and you, they're not. So today I have this Kramer box that you can see there. Um, this was designed to go into a conferencing room just like this about 15 years ago when people still used analog video and HDMI. And so this one does an okay job. Sometimes it's not perfect. Sometimes things cut out. Sometimes you get the weird green bars. Um, but for the purpose of this talk and not bringing more gear, this one is doing fine. Um, the other one that I'll talk about because I own one at home is a slightly newer mixing desk. Um, this one is fun because it creates its own unique glitchy artifacts that can look quite artistic as it's going along and it adds its own bit of flavor. It doesn't, if you plugged in a CRT TV and plugged in an output from this, you would get two different things, but the different thing this does is kind of cool and in some videos later I'll show that. Um, or you can capture your video from a CRT by pointing a camera at it. Um, the one thing to note is you need to have a camera that you can set the shutter speed to be the same as the video sync rate so you don't see wavy things. If you're in Australia, that's 50 hertz. If you're in a, many other parts of the world, that's 60 hertz. Um, so, annoyingly, my current phone doesn't do this automatically. I tried it the other day. My old phone did do it automatically, which made capturing video pretty easy. Um, so now we come on to the device that may or may not work that I circuit bent during um, Hack Week. Now, one of the great things about this device is, well, first, what is this device? What does it do? You can see we're talking about VHS, VCR players. So this was designed for if you're an enthusiast, you want to take your home videos to the next level, you could use this to add, you could spend $4,000 in the late 80s and 90s. Um, you could use this to add titles to your video. Um, so basically you had two VCRs, like this one and this one, which you would play video into the system. You could then fade in and out black or swap between the two videos and um, you could add titles. That part of this doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. It's a SCART connector. Uh, um, I will show you. A <laughs> um, bas basically, a SCART connector is a weird connector that can do multiple video formats in and in and out at the same time, depending on who you are. I have some. Yes, HDMI, but analog. Um, <laughs> and so you then have a third VCR where you record back whatever you're playing in through the first two and mixing. And then you could add some audio as well and there's a microphone. So you could add a voiceover to your home video later if you felt like it. And that was the purpose of this device. Um, the other video mixer I showed you before, that was actually used by a skydiving company to edit all their videos for their clients before I came into its hands. Um, but the coolest thing about this device is when you go to the second page on Google, you get the full service manual, which if you want to circuit vend and modify a device is a really useful thing to have. So scrolling through here, there's some guides on how to pull it apart that I didn't pay attention to. But then we have a full parts list of all the ICs and coming down eventually, along with the parts lists, we have full schematics. And so I sat down for half a day and looked at the schematics and tried to reverse engineer them well enough to take out some things that I thought would be interesting. Um, scrolling this laptop is horrible. And along with the sch schematics, somewhere down here we have some block diagrams that can help you understand the schematics even easier. And so even for me as someone with limited electrical background, I could eventually figure out kind of what was going on here well enough to, rather than one method of circuit bending, 
is you just open it up, you start shorting wires together. When you see something cool, you take notes of the pins. You maybe take note of which pins are the power pins on the chips so you don't short them, so you don't fry the chips as you're going. But we, I was able to take some slightly more educated guesses based off the circuit diagram. So that was fun. Um, and so once I'd taken these educated guesses, I used my engineering handwriting to write them down on a piece of paper. And so we see things like D, the diode number four is where a video signal comes in. Diode number seven is where the other one comes in. Um, basically, what I decided I would do is I'd replicate this dirty video mixer from before and try and feed it into the back color so you could fade to a um, random mixed glitchy thing from the proper signal. That It doesn't actually work like that most of the time. That was what I tried. And so, yeah, I also saw this color generation chip, which is fun and cool, and I'm going to come back to one day, which allows us to select between the different back colors that we want to fade to. Um, but that's for another day. So here is the insides. Now, most importantly, going back to my safety warning, I know enough about electronics to know that this bit here um, is all the 240 stuff. And I was happy that I could pull out these other boards and mess around with them without touching these capacitors here that possibly had deadly charges in them. And so I felt at least safe to myself. Again, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do this. Pick a battery device or a nine volt device instead. Um, as we can see from the burn marks here, this device has had a bit of a tough life. I bought it already circuit bent. Um, it was never functioning properly, I'm presuming. But that adds to the fun. Um, and next, we moved on to some CAD, our cardboard-aided design. <laughs> and I built my front panel with some switches and I soldered a bunch of wires in. I think we don't get to see them. And now, if it hasn't destroyed itself on an aeroplane, we're going to plug some things in and we'll see if it will do something. The weirdest thing about this whole project is, even though, t though the two video inputs should do the same thing, they don't. And so, now that I've plugged them in, if we grab this on our video switcher, somewhere in here I've got a proper diagram, which actually, I gave this talk last week. Um, oh yeah, we're gonna just go to this, this is where I got to after Hack Week. Very fast, very flickery, kind of not really usable, but at the same time, if you captured it at five frames per second, you could turn it into a cool GIF emote for Slack. <laughs> That's basic. <laughs> um, that is basically how far we got to in the Hack Week project. Um, so we're going to have a break from the flickering. And we're going to load something. I'm not sure why we're... Thanks, Google. Um, <laughs> Google has decided it doesn't want to load the next video. We are going to power on without that video, I guess. It was very similar, but slightly different. Um, oh, there it is. I don't know why we were loading the last page, but then I plugged some different things in one day. The, the car is my desktop wallpaper. And once I made it do this, this is really cool. I have no idea how I got it to do this. It will never do that again. <laughs> but <laughs> at least I recorded a video of it doing that so we know that it is possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to stop the flickering images for a second. And I think what we're going to do is, after Hack Week and I've got something to work, I proceeded to clean it up. You can see we've got no more piece of cardboard because that would have been extra fun going through an airport. Um, <laughs> here is an inside shot again. Um, you can see that I have cut capacitors and soldered wires to them and then in here I have, again, I don't know what I'm doing, 
but a great concept. There's an extra diode in here. So theoretically, only make the video signal come back in. I don't know if that actually works. I thought it might help. It made it easier to solder things in, so it's there. And basically, I've repeated that process for um, most things. Um, here is our set of switches to choose between the two video sources, the color source. I also added a, one of the output sources back in um, as a, to try and create feedback. That didn't work, but I thought it was worth a try in experimenting because that's what half of this was. And so now you can see it here at the front. To make this slide template and that title slide, I was using this to generate the glitchy background. Um, this one is fading, taking that glitchiness and fading it to white or black so the slides are actually readable. And then this one was doing all the blue overlays using an image mask. I probably have too much gear now. But now i will start to get into the demos. So basically the demo setup today is we have our um, video editor. As I said before, I've got a set-top box playing that image. I've got my reversing cabinet that I paid too much for. You can get it much cheaper on AliExpress. Then I have my laptop and my other camera going into this switcher box as well, which is doing the correcting we talked about before. It's also converting from analog to digital. And in theory, it should be giving a HDMI signal that won't break anything else. Um, so with that, let's jump into the demo and see what we get. Which normally if I put it in bypass mode, okay, bypass mode is working now. That's good. So we've got the webcam, this little reversing camera is on video two. We have the Hackweek logo, logo on the media player in video one. You can see we've already got a bit of feeding back and stuff not working correctly. If I turn bypass off, it's gonna fix itself. So let's presume that the bypass is working the wrong way, but now we can start to mess around. Um, my, I've used a different tripod at the last conference and I ended up with the wrong tripod plate, which means that someone in Melbourne has my tripod plate <laughs> and it's bad, but one of the reasons it's attached to this Meccano stick is that I can kind of hold it like that and we can do both cameras at the same time. And so I can fade, could swap between the two sources. Um, this is kind of hard doing all this at once and looking at that. When we go to the program mode, this is sometimes when cool stuff happens. Oh, now the bypasses. Oh, we're getting color generation today. <laughs> well, this didn't, this didn't work in the last conference, so that's fun. And this is the point where I blew up the conference system last time. <laughs> <laughs> um, today it seems to be doing some fun stuff. And you can, but you can see those green lines and the flickering. The other set of stuff I have at home captures things much better and there's like a white patterns here option so we can fade in and fade out to our background image. I can flick the switches, the switches are doing something today. I can blend between stuff. And so you can see in the background of everything, it is trying to work the way I intended. Oh, and today we're even getting the Hackwick logo. That never works either. So I have a lovely pre-recorded demo of the one time that this worked. Um, now we're getting to see this, I might actually turn off the other camera because now we can record something cool that the world is never going to see again. And that is half the fun. Um, <laughs> and so we can, sometimes we get flickering madness. Again, the green is the time-based corrector trying to do its best to make sense of what's going on in the world of this glitchiness. Um, and oh yeah, we're getting all the flicker there. And then we get this quite calm, one thing I have noticed is if I can get the flicker back, the flicker has a bar, and if you time it just right, you can actually get that Hackwick logo to come up in the center. But I'm not gonna try that right now. We might go back to the 
if I press the right button on the other switcher, we'll get my laptop back. Hopefully, there we go. So, um, future plans, as I said, there was that color generation chip, so at the start you saw all that red. Basically, there is a big rotary switch here, which generates different voltages going into that chip. I thought it would be fun to make it audio responsive by sending audio into that chip. Fortunately, I have the schematics, so I didn't just try it straight away because that would have blown stuff up because I wanted to take audio from after the audio volume slider. And on this design, audio at that point is running between minus 12 and zero volts, whereas the color chip takes in between zero and three volts. And that would have ended in lots of magic white smoke. So now, unfortunately, I have to go and do proper electronics and design a circuit to convert the voltages to be right. And then we might add some audio reaction. Um, that's me talking about that. And finally, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, here is a couple of other Hope and Hardware projects that you can look at. Um, this is called the Crap Video, Gener Video Synth. Um, basically, this is a cool, clever design that someone's come up with. I have bought the PCBs for this. It's sitting in a big box of stuff that I have to solder together one day. Um, basically, what he's done is he's taken an old VGA test kit, an old VGA tester off um, eBay, use that to generate his sync signals, and then you can just send whatever voltage is in you want for red, green, and blue, and you will generate some cool synth stuff. Um, oh, that's right, this slide is too late. Um, this one here uses a VGA to, comp to a composite converter and does the, you can short the memory chip and make cool glitches that way. So that's another one you can look at. I'm being given the not much time thing. And so now I think it is time for questions, but as we do that, here is one I recorded earlier when everything was working. Um, there's a video playing here with all the, you can see these glitches at the bottom. That is what my other time-based corrector does. But if you run this directly into that, it also makes more flicker. So that's one thing. While that's going, does anyone have any questions? If we have time for questions. Uh, well, I know we are late, but... Uh... But let's have questions because this is the last talk. So anyone? And here is another thing that I made it do once that it will never do again. Kind of similar to what it's doing today, actually. So anyone got questions about the madness? Or if not, you can come and see me later. Otherwise, I'll just leave this video running for a couple of minutes. And Does your nose still work? What was that? Does your nose still work? Does my what work? Nose. Um, no. Do you smell toast? What was that? Do you smell toast? Smell toast? No. I, I have bad allergies. I smell nothing. <laughs> <laughs> have you thrown up in the process of making these videos? No, I haven't because <laughs> well, you can kind of see up here I have 100 hertz. Nice big CRC TV that I can... I don't normally watch these videos on a screen this big. The last conference, the screen was four times as big, and that was even crazier. But. So the, the next question for that, the metric is: Could we throw up if we watch it long enough? Um, <laughs> so if you were if you were the wrong sort of person, yes. Um, the initial one with a lot of flickering, I didn't watch for very long. This is much better than that. So yes, you could probably make yourself sick. If you, if, you ha if you have epilepsy, you could absolutely trigger an epilepsy if fit, which is why I told those people to leave already. Um, yeah. You said you use that for your music. Where's the music? Um, <laughs> I, got so, I, I got so distracted making video stuff that I haven't done much video uh, music stuff again since. But somewhere over to the right of this picture there, or left of this picture, there is a thing. Synthesizer. All right, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>